All right, so here we are in the third video. So to begin this one, we're going to talk about mixing light. Um, so the fact that white light from the sun is a composite of all the visible frequencies is easily demonstrated by passing light, sunlight through a prism and looking at the rainbow spectrum. Um, the distribution of solar frequencies is uneven. Um, the most being in the yellow-green part of the spectrum. So uh, first off, the sun is not yellow. The sun is white. Um, and we'll talk about why that is here in a few minutes. But um, the sun is actually white. But even though the sun is white, uh, it kind of prefers yellow and green, the yellow-green part of the spectrum. And um, there's a couple things about that. Uh, first off, you may have noticed that you know um, people who are flagging traffic during construction, they wear yellow-green vests. That's because those vests are brightest under sunlight. And it's also kind of interesting to note that our eyes have evolved to have their maximum sensitivity in that range. Our eyes are tuned to our sun. Um, so you may be familiar with fire engines being red. Well, they're starting to be painted this yellow-green color. It makes them stand out more. Um, kind of explains why at night we see better under the illumination of a yellow sodium vapor lamp uh, instead of common tungsten filament lamps of the same brightness. Um, this is a, a graphical distribution of the brightness versus frequency. It's called the radiation curve of our sunlight. And again, we see the peak of that curve in this yellow-green region here. It's also why I'm using yellow for my highlighter to really point things out. So most whites produced from the reflection of the sunlight kind of share this uh, distribution, um, where it's a little bit stronger in the yellow-green part of the spectrum, which is the, the right middle of the spectrum. So we have seen that all visible frequencies mixed together make white. Uh, interestingly enough, though, the perception of white is also the result from a combination of only red, green, and blue. And you may remember that those are the three cone sensors in your eyes. So um, if we project these three colors on a screen overlapping with each other, uh, this is kind of what we see here. So uh, red and uh, blue, when mixed together, make magenta. Well, magenta is not actually a frequency, so it's a, a combination. Red and, uh, red and green make yellow, blue and green make cyan, and then red, blue, and green mixed together make white. So when the beams of light reflect off of this white screen, uh, the light's seen as an additive mixture. Uh, the lights are added together before the observer sees them. So if two of them, two of the three colors are added, uh, then another color will be produced. By adding these various amounts of red, green, blue, the colors to which uh, you know, our three types of cones are sensitive to, we can produce any color of the spectrum. Something else is kind of cool. If you take magenta and green and mix them together, you get white. Or blue and yellow mix white. We can also kind of do a subtractive thing here. I told you before, the sun is white. And the sky kind of appears to be blue. Well, if you take white minus blue, you're left with yellow. So the reason why our sun appears to be yellow is because we have a blue sky. And if we take white light from the sun and we subtract away some of that blue, we're left with yellow. So that's why our sun looks to be yellow when, in fact, it is white, which I think is kind of an interesting thing. Um, so uh, for this reason, red, green, and blue uh, are called the additive primary colors. Uh, if you take a look at your cell phone or TV screen and look at it very closely, you'll find that there's just tiny little spots um, less than a millimeter across, and that uh, when the screen is lit, some of these spots are red, some of them are green, some of them are blue. The mixture of these primary colors at a distance provide a complete range of colors. Um, so that's mixing light. Now we can talk about mixing pigment. So this is more of what the artists, if you want to be a painter. So, you know, every artist knows that if you take red paint, green paint, and blue paint and mix them together, you're not going to get white paint. Uh, it's going to be a muddy dark brown. 
Uh, red and green paint certainly do not combine to form yellow. Um, so, uh, as is, you know, the rule for additive mixtures, um, or as it is for the rule of additive mixtures. So, the mixing of paints is an entirely different process from the mixture of colored lights. Uh, paint is composed of pigments. They're tiny solid particles that produce their own characteristic color by uh, selective absorption or transmission of frequencies. Um, so, um, when red and green pigments are combined, every color in the white light that illuminates them is absorbed and the mixture is black. So, um, red and green kind of makes this, this black. Uh, the mixture of absorbing pigments uh, results in the subtraction of colors. So the observer sees the light left over after absorption has taken place. So we kind of get this uh, graph right here. So color printing, then, um, it's kind of an interesting aspect. You may have noticed when you buy ink for your printer, it's always uh, magenta, cyan, and yellow. Those are the three colors that you buy. And this is why. If you kind of take cyan and yellow, mix them together, you get green, cyan, or I'm sorry, uh, magenta and yellow mixed together gives you your red, cyan and magenta mixed together gives you your blue. So when you go to buy printer ink, that's why it's cyan, yellow, and magenta. It's using a different uh, formula for mixing these together. So, um, you know, three photographs are taken um, of the illustration to be printed. One through a magenta filter, one through a yellow filter, one through a cyan filter. This produces three negatives, uh, each with a different pattern of exposed areas. Corresponds to the filter used and the color distribution from the original illustration. Light is shown through these negatives on a metal plates that are specially treated to hold the printer's ink. Uh, only in areas that have been exposed to the light. The ink deposits are regulated on different parts of the plate by tiny dots. Uh, examine the color pictures in the book, in any book, with a magnifying glass, and you will see those uh, three tiny dots overlapping to give the appearance of many colors. So, uh, this kind of sums up, this graph right here sums up the rules for color mixing. So we have the additive rules. This is if you're mixing, like, uh, different flashlights. The subtractive rules, like if you're mixing pigments. So the subtractive rules for, like, uh, paints and, uh, you know, printer ink and things like that. So um, we see the sum of blue and red is magenta. The sum of green and blue is cyan. The sum of red and green is yellow. So we see that magenta is the opposite of green, and uh, yellow is the opposite of blue. So this, this comes up with something we call uh, complementary colors. Um, so yellow and blue mixed together um, is going to make white. Uh, so we can, you know, get these different things here. So a, a color plus its opposite makes white. So we call any two colors that add together to produce white complementary colors. So there's something to kind of think of. All right, now for the sky. Why is the sky blue? So if a beam of a particular frequency of sound is directed to a tuning fork, of a similar frequency. The tuning fork will be set into vibration and uh, effectively redirect the beam in many directions. So I've shown this to you in the classroom with my uh, resonating. So I hit one tuning fork, I hold it, and the second tuning fork starts to resonate and you can hear that. Uh, it was the tuning forks in the, the two uh, box cavities. Um, so the tuning fork scatters the sound. Uh, a similar process occurs with the scattering of light from atoms and particles that are far apart um, in our atmosphere. So we know that these atoms of small particles, they, they act like tiny optical tuning forks, and they re-emit light waves that shine on them. The tinier the particle, the higher the frequency of light that it will scatter. So nitrogen and oxygen molecules... Um, and the tiny particles that make up our atmosphere are like little tiny tuning forks that energize that are, that are energized by sunlight, scattering the light in all directions. Uh, most of the ultraviolet light from the sun is absorbed by a thin layer called the ozone in the upper atmosphere. 
The remaining ultraviolet light that passes through the atmosphere is scattered by atmospheric particles, molecules. Um, so of the visible light, violet is scattered the most, followed by blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. Red is scattered only a tenth as much as violet. So although violet light is scattered more than blue, our eyes are not very sensitive to violet light. Uh, so the lesser amount of blue predominates our vision, and we see a blue sky. So that part's important right there. Um, the blue sky of uh, very it varies in different places under different conditions. Um, a principal factor is the water vapor content. So on a clear day, clear dry day, the sky is much deeper blue than on clear days with high humidity. Uh, places in the upper atmosphere is uh, where it's extremely dry, like Italy and Greece, have beautiful blue skies. Uh, inspired painters for centuries, where there are a lot of particles of dust and other particles larger than oxygen and nitrogen, the lower frequencies are scattered more. This makes the sky less blue, and it takes on uh, more of a whitish appearance. So after a heavy rainstorm, uh, when the particles have been washed away, the sky becomes a deeper blue. Uh, pollution, with its larger particles, scattered low frequency light. So for uh, the larger of these particles, absorption rather than scattering takes place, and you get a brownish haze. So during sunsets, uh, the lower frequencies of light are scattered less by nitrogen and oxygen. So red, orange, and yellow light are transmitted through our atmosphere easier, much more easier than violets and blues. So red, which is scattered the least, passes right through the atmosphere more than any other color. So um, when white light from our sun passes through the thick part of our atmosphere, like at dawn or dusk, um, the, the lower frequencies can get through. So the red light goes right through. But the higher frequencies can't get through. They're scattered. So that's why the sun looks redder when it first rises and when it sets. Uh, the sunlight has to go through a thicker part of the atmosphere. But at high noon, the sunlight, it, it goes through less. Okay, it goes through less atmosphere. So uh, it, it doesn't look red at that time. It looks more yellow. Um, so late in the day, sunlight must pass through more atmosphere. Only the low frequencies can get through, making it look red. Um, and I believe, yep, that was the, the last part of our notes here. So uh, with that, that finishes up these notes. Um, I encourage you to find some other videos uh, discussing the, the, the matter you know, found in this uh, unit. There's a lot of really good stuff out there. But that finishes uh, this video.